I missed out a name in my obituary section in the roundup I did for 2013. I missed out a name. His name is Florentino Fernandez. He was a middleweight, started at welterweight. I only sort of came by him through watching some of them Steve Lott videos. I was telling you guys to sub, I've done a recommendation video for his channel. Florentino was a very good fighter. He was a very good fighter. He was an unbeaten prospect at the start of his career. He took an L in Venezuela, his first loss. A first round TKO loss to someone named Kalingo. He avenged it in his next fight in Cuba, actually. So they had professional boxing in Cuba in the 50s. I didn't realize that. Maybe that was before Castro started reshaping the communist angle and all that stuff there. He lost on points to Emil Griffiths. No shame in that. Unanimous decision, no shame in that. Griffiths, Hall of Famer. Lost by TKO to Dick Tiger. No shame in that either. Dick Tiger, a double weight champion and a very good fighter. And that was due to a broken nose stoppage. It seems like he was a bit of a bleeder. He lost a few fights on cuts. He avenged a lot of his losses, like the ones to Rivero. Coming back to kill him and outpoint him twice, you know. You know what I mean? So that's what it was like back then, folks. You know, you'd have to take it L and come back sometimes. That's what it was like. You know what I mean, a different era of boxing. Big puncher, hard jab, good inside fighter. 43 KOs and 50 victories. Lost 16, 67 fights in total. Good fighter, good fighter. Ruben Hurricane Carter, he stopped him in a round, but knocked him out in a round, but there's no shame in that. Hurricane was a massive puncher. He was a massive puncher. And, you know, on his day, Carter could knock out anybody on his day. He knocked out Emil Griffiths in a round. Hurricane Carter was a threat back in the day until the police railroaded him and trumped up some fucked up murder charge. You know what I mean? On some racist bullshit. But, you know, yeah, Florentino... The only man to ever stop Jose Torres, who was a former light heavyweight champion, trained by Customato. Torres was also a mentor to Mike Tyson back in the Dizzy. And is still a prominent figure in boxing. I can't remember in capacity. He works for one of the governing bodies, doesn't he, Torres? I can't remember which one. I'm just going to assume it's the WBC. You know what I mean, I'll research it later. He's the only man to stop Torres. Only man. Only man to ever do that. You add that into the fact that he took um, Gene Fulmer the distance in attempting to take Fulmer's middleweight world championship. Split decision loss. And what you got to figure in, man, like, there was only one belt for the most part, one major belt. So you lose by a split decision. In hindsight, looking at it today, that's really big. That's really big, you know. He was a world-class fighter. He was a world-class fighter. And it seems that most... Um, the major sites and boxing press missed his death. Or at least most of us did. <laughs> and the YTBC, his death was missed. So, belated RIP. Should have been in the obituary column. So what I'll do, I'll drop the fight he had with Ortega. In the box, it's a really good fight. And see if I can find any more fights. I want to see some more of him myself. Now, I've heard people say that Ruben Hurricane Carter was a terrible fighter. Well, he wasn't a terrible fighter. He wasn't the most skilled fighter, but he, he was a good fighter. He was a tough guy. He was a very tough guy. He was only stopped once on cuts. Yeah. He was a, just a basically a big puncher. Probably lacked a little finesse. But you've got to take into consideration, you know, he knocked out Emma Griffiths in a round, floored him twice and stopped him. I think the fight could have carried on, but what do I know? You know, he um, lost to guys like Joey Giardello, who was a really good boxer from Italian extraction. Unanimous decision loss. No shame. Giardello was a really good boxer. Go watch Giardello. He had great movement. He, he was a good boxer. He was a good boxer and a good puncher. Even in fights, he lost like to guys like Luis Rodriguez. who You know, these guys were names back in the day. They was always in the thick of the action. I think, I'm not sure if Rodriguez was a light middleweight champion or, or what. These were good fighters, you know. He knocked him down before losing on points to Rodriguez. He was always a threat, you know. Went the distance with guys like Dick Tiger. Actually outpointed George Benton, who was a really good fighter back in the day. You know, he beat guys like Holly Mims. He wasn't a bad fighter. He wasn't a bad fighter. He wasn't a bad fighter. 
but his story is really more about how he was arrested for a triple homicide. Him and his friend John Artis were tried and convicted twice in 1967 and 1976 for the murders. But after the second conviction was overturned in 85, the prosecutors chose not to try the case for a third time. He learned to box in the army for the United States. He turned pro after doing a little stint in jail. I think he snatched a purse. Not a nice crime, you know. Some of you might think, well, he deserved to do 15 to nearly 20 years or so that he had to spend in jail or so. But, you know, that's your opinion. That's the threshold of standards you set. I can't say nothing against that. Can't say nothing for it, you know. But he did his time for that. And then police, man, just to take someone's freedoms away like that. You know, for years, knowing that man's just rotting behind bars. But he, he stayed very strong. Mentally, he stayed strong in that cell. And he had to. And he had to. And he came out, turned pro. Like I said, you know, he beat Florentino Fernandez, Holly Mims, Brennan... Gomeo Brennan, who I don't know nothing about, and George Benton, I know the other three though. And you know, you know, he, he was a decent contender. He was a decent contender. Yeah. So he wasn't as bad as people are saying he was. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. His conviction for murder inspired singers like Bob Dylan to dedicate a song about him, and he was a longtime campaigner to try and get the guy out of jail. Ruben is still with us today. Denzel Washington actually made a film about him called The Hurricane. Really good film. Go check that out. And um, I'll put a link of the Bob Dylan song in there. And if I can find any clips or a link to Denzel's film, I'll put that in too. Peace. Going back to Cuba and their association with professional boxing. And this is from Wikipedia. This is from Wikipedia. One source here is from Wikipedia and the other is not. Apparently, Cuba are about to enter the World Series of Boxing, which is amateur boxing in a professional format, basically. They won't have no vests, no headgear. But then again, I think in a lot of amateur um, boxing now, there's no headgear. There's no headgear. But basically, the World Series of Boxing is a relatively new concept, which is about four or five years old now. And it just helps blood amateur boxers into the pro style of fighting. And um, yeah, the Cubans are about to enter that. They'll be able to earn about 1000 to $3,000 a month. They'll be able to earn a little something. As for pro boxing... And like I said, this is from Wikipedia. The only reason I took this from Wikipedia is, you know, somebody has actually told me that there are people regulating Wikipedia. So you can't just really post up a whole load of garbage up there and get away with it anymore. <laughs> For all I know, that could be some bullshit, but that's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Plus, I'm trying to exercise some common sense. And, you know, sometimes you can tell if something sounds really wacky. This doesn't seem like something that someone would need to lie about. You know, like when they do some of um, President Obama's pages. Like I saw one where they just took liberties with Obama, the Wikipedia page, but I'm not sure if that's still up. But um, as for, let's continue with this boxing thing. In 1909 is when the first Cuban professional boxing fight took place. They banned it two years later because of the violence in the streets between black and whites. So boxing went underground behind closed doors. However, they reinstated the sport back into the public domain in 1921, along with wrestling. And they banned it in 1961. Castro banned it when he was leading the Cuban revolution. Sport is not just another instrument of the market, nor of Profit for promoters, agents, and all the manner of parasites that feed off the athletes' hard work, said Castro in 2005. Castro is no longer in office. His brother Royal has taken over. And he's obviously going to make a few changes and reforms. 
So who knows what the future is for Cuban boxing? Who knows? Who knows? George Benton, another fighter who I mentioned in this video earlier, was a master boxer. Was a master boxer who was, you know, just like many black fighters. Yes, I know you don't like to hear me say, you know, you know well, the black fighters got treated badly, but it's just the truth. It's got to be said, I'm afraid, you know. He was denied opportunities, so it was a hard road for George, a very hard road. You know, he became the number one ranked middleweight in the world in the early 60s. He never got a shot. In 1962, he beat Joey Giardello. Like I said before, Joey Giardello was no joke. He beat Giardello and thought he'd get a title shot. However, Lou Duva, Giardello's manager, funnily enough, was well connected and was able to get Giardello a fight with Dick Tiger for the World Middleweight Championship, which Giardello won by decision. Yeah, I screwed George out of his shot, Duva said. He didn't even know about it until I told him many years later. Wow. The reason I started laughing when I heard that Lou Duva was Giardello's manager and he screwed Benton out of his shot is because Benton, later on in the 80s, became the main trainer for Lou Duva's cat. Wow, that's a serious story. <laughs> Benton's career ended in 1970 after he was shot. The shooter tried to pick up Benton's sister in a bar and Benton's brother beat him up, vowed to kill someone from the Benton family. The man shot Benton in his back. He was in and out of hospital for two years. The bullet is still lodged near Benton's spine. He turned to training after that, studied under Eddie Futch, was in Joe Frazier's corner for his third fight with Muhammad Ali, the thriller of Manila. He was also in the corner of Leon Spinks when he upset Ali to win the world title, the World Heavyweight Championship, way back in the 70s. <laughs> for 17 years, Benton worked with Lou Duva and the Duva family's promotion company, Main Events, which today is headed by Kathy Duva, for those of you who don't know. Benton was the head trainer. And with two, look, 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 look. Evander Holyfield, Mike McCallum, Meldrick Taylor, Perma Whitaker, all of them guys. Like, out of them four boxers, only Mike McCallum wasn't in the 84 Olympic team in Los Angeles. You know, and look, 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 look at the names. He was the main trainer. In 1989 and 1990, Benton was named Trainer of the Year by the Boxing Writers Association of America. In 2001, he was elected into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. He died in 2011 after a battle with pneumonia. There's a video where, you know, he's attributed to being a great exponent of that so cliched shoulder roll and Philly show move. He was supposed to be a great exponent of that. I can't find it. And for all of you looking to get on my nerves, not George Benson, George Benton. Yeah? You know, he went in hard, he went in hard. In them days, you had to fight credible opponents. You, you you wouldn't get paid. You wouldn't get paid. So if some of you guys, you know, you go to the box wreck and these old fighters, oh, I didn't fight anybody. Look, let me tell you this now. Let me tell you this now. If they put you in a fight on a bill, they're not going to put you in Tom and Jerry so you can blow someone over and collect your money and run. No, no. They're going to pitch you with someone tough. And these guys were tough because they don't have impressive box wreck stats. Stop reading into that. You need to stop reading into that. I'm not saying all of them were killers, but you, you couldn't just take dough out the game like that. You couldn't do that. You couldn't do that. You had to put on a show. You had to put on a show and you had to fight well. If you could take my word on anything, take my word on that. Take my word on that. You know, you fought guys like Holly Mims, good fighter, Henry Hank, Joey Giardello, Hall of Famer Joey Giardello. So, <laughs> there you go. And he beat him. Ruben Hurricane Carter, contender, big, big puncher. Lost on points to him. You guys have to recognize that, man. You know, you, you guys have to recognize the unbeaten record wasn't really a concept for boxers then. It just wasn't a concept. It was about getting in the ring with who they match you with and putting on a good show. You had to fight often. You had to fight 
whoever they matched you up with, you had to be ready. If a, if somebody phoned you and there was a fight there for you, have to, you had to take the fight because you would get a reputation. They'd, they'd tell other people that, yo, he's turning fights now. You wouldn't get no work. You wouldn't get no work. You know, guys like James J. Braddock, Jersey Joe Walcott, they was in welfare relief and shit like that when they got their world title shots. And they were good fighters, really good fighters. Unless you had somebody behind you, like Joey Giardello had Lou Duva, who was going to try and guide you to a smoother road to the title, the only way you could make money was to go in tough. That, or you couldn't make money. There's no way like someone like um, George Benton could fight powder puff people and make any dough at all. It just couldn't happen. It just couldn't happen. And that just didn't go for black fighters. If you're Italian, Latin, Mexican or whatever... You couldn't go in soft and make no money because you wouldn't get paid. Think about this. Think about this. He's the number one contender already. Yeah? He's beat Joey Giardello, a top contender. Can't get a title shot. Lou Duva just told you. You just read it there. You screwed him out of his title shot. That's probably why he took him as the main trainer. Well, that's not why he took him because he was really good at what he did. Couldn't get a title shot. No matter what he did. It's not like today. You know, like, okay, a Lusagun, a Jose, he had to wait a little time before he could get his shot and he fought Batise. But yo, a Jose was getting step aside money. And you get decent checks when you step aside. You get decent checks when you step aside. George Benton wasn't getting that back then. He wasn't getting that back then. He just got shafted out of his shot and that was that. And that was that. And you have to stay motivated. You have to stay motivated. So he fought for another eight years until he got shot and had to retire. You know what I mean? So you, you think about it. If he didn't get shot, if he didn't get shot, yeah, from 1962 when he beat Joey Giardello, he had to stay motivated. He had to stay in shape on the off chance he could get a title shot. He's got to feed himself, his family. And they're not paying him the earth for these bouts. Let's say he carried on fighting and he got a title shot two or three years after he got shot. He'd be 10 years past his prime when he was number one contender in 1962. This is circumstances that fighters had to go through back then. Archie Moore, 16 year wait. I'm going to keep telling you people that 16 year wait for a title shot. Generally, I try to take each era for what each era represents. That's what I try to do. You know, it's unfair to say the fighters then were better. It is, it is unfair. It's unfair to say the fighters now are better as well. It is unfair. I take each era on, on their own merits for the most part. That's what I do. If all the fighters today, if all they have to endure... It's people saying, oh, you're not as good as the old school fighters or, you know, you're cherry picking or you don't fight a lot. That's a small price to pay. That's a small price to pay, I suppose, for, you know, the way the dynamic between fighter and the machine has changed. It's a small price to pay. Back then, most of the brain damage would have been picked up by sparring. They used to spar excessively. Like, guys like Benton would have sparred excessively because, like, you know, the opportunities ain't coming about in the ring. So I have to stay busy by sparring. That's why they were so technically sound back then as well. But this is the first old school corner. And we'll be back with more very soon. Very soon.